Here's my recipe for the perfect start to any day. It's coffee, shower, aftershave. And though today's sponsor can't help you with the first or second step in that routine, they definitely have the third step covered. I am of course talking about Scentbird, the company that's reimagining everything about how people discover, shop for, and experience fragrances. Scentbird lets you choose a new design of fragrance every month for just $17. With each fragrance, you'll get a generous 30 day supply in one of these travel friendly vials, so you can try them out before committing to a full size bottle and experiment to find your signature scent. They have over 600 perfumes and colognes, and a lot of unisex options too, including designer brands and indie darlings. This month, I received Yuso Vert Jogger, the perfect after shower scent, and my wife's personal favourite, Creed Aventus, which is full of sophisticated warming notes. And finally, Raw Spirit Wildfire, an exotic blend of jasmine petals, lang lang, cedarwood, Australian sandalwood and musk. Elevate your daily routine by heading to scentbird.com or by clicking my link in the description. Use my coupon code MASQUERADE55 for 55% off. It's just a little over $7 for your first month, available in the USA and Canada. Thanks Scentbird for the sponsorship, check out their links below. Born in San Jose, California, to Vietnamese American parents, Annie Lay seemed destined for greatness from a young age. Friendly, courteous, and a smart cookie to boot, she had been voted most likely to be the next Einstein by her high school peers. Indeed, a career in science did seem written in her stars. She had earned a $160,000 scholarship to study cell developmental biology at the University of Rochester, one of the country's most prestigious research colleges. It was there, in 2007, that she met Jonathan Wodorski, her best friend, college sweetheart, and soulmate. The pair quickly became inseparable, and before their studies concluded, Jonathan had popped the question, and Annie had said yes. After graduating from Rochester, the pair would go on to study doctorates in neighbouring states, Jonathan at Columbia University in New York, and Annie at Yale in Connecticut. Despite being separated by 76 miles, the couple stayed in regular contact, catching up near most every day, and meeting up whenever they could to discuss their upcoming marriage. It was September 8th, 2009 in New Haven, Connecticut, five days before the wedding, and three days before Annie was due to fly out to Long Island where their ceremony was going to be held. Her mind was swirling with romantic thoughts about her big day with Jonathan and their upcoming honeymoon in Greece. Before that though, she needed to finish up some research for her pharmacological doctorate. That morning, she took the Yale Transit to her campus office in the Sterling Hall of Medicine. From there, she proceeded on foot to her laboratory on 10 Amistad Street. These images, captured by surveillance cameras outside, show Annie entering the building at 10.09am. The day wore on, and eventually all of the researchers and staff members left the Amistad building and went home. Everyone that is, except for Annie. Her roommates grew concerned when 9pm rolled around and she still hadn't returned home. Annie was a cautious person by nature, one who took safety extremely seriously. She didn't lead a high risk lifestyle, never walked anywhere at night alone, and had written an article for Yale's B magazine titled, Crime and Safety in New Haven, advising others to organise transport home during the evening hours. During her research for the article, she had learned several morbid facts, such as how, in the US alone, 17 people are killed by a co-worker every single week. With a little street smarts, she wrote, one can avoid becoming a statistic. Unable to reach Annie by phone, one of her five roommates, Natalie Powers, contacted the New Haven Police Department and reported her missing. They in turn called the FBI. Upon investigation, the authorities discovered Annie's personal effects still inside her office, including her wallet, purse, and mobile phone. The only thing she seemed to have taken to the lab with her was her ID card and a large item related to her research. When agents arrived at the Amistad building, both staff and students alike were extremely concerned to hear that one of their own was missing, and their hearts sank even further when they learned it was Annie. A vibrant girl with an infectious laugh and a perpetual smile, Annie was not only popular, but also highly respected. Her research was promising, 
and have practical applications in the treatment of diabetes and certain forms of cancer. They knew how much of an asset she was not only to Yale, but to the world. The type of person who could really make a difference. It was imperative she be found as quickly as possible, and the university itself offered a $10,000 award to anyone with information pertaining to her whereabouts. Several people had reportedly seen Annie earlier that day, entering room G13, a relatively secluded basement laboratory which housed research mice. Keycard data confirmed that she had swiped into G13 at 10.11am, two minutes after entering the building. Worryingly, she had never swiped out. After examining the CCTV footage captured outside the Amistad building, investigators noticed that although Annie was seen entering Amistad, none of the 75 security cameras in the surrounding area had captured her leaving. She had to still be on the premises. Unfortunately, they weren't able to track her movements inside the building. The one security camera in the basement didn't catch any footage of Annie. The hallways were roamed, the rooms and labs scoured, the dumpsters outside sifted through, but there was no trace of Annie Lay anywhere. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. On September 10th, all of the staff and students who had worked in the Amistad building the day Annie disappeared were interviewed. Each of them reported that at 12.50pm that day, the fire alarm had unexpectedly been sounded, prompting everyone to evacuate the building. Nobody reported seeing Annie during the exodus. Nobody, that is, except for a lab technician. 24-year-old Raymond Clark III. Raymond's job involved taking care of the mice in three lab rooms, including G13, where he occasionally worked shoulder to shoulder with Annie. He claimed to have seen Annie leave the building at 12.45pm, just before the fire alarm went off. Detectives began to speculate whether the bride-to-be had gotten cold feet before the wedding and had vanished of her own accord, triggering the alarm and sneaking out undetected. But Annie's friends and family were adamant that wasn't the case. Annie had been meticulously planning her big day for over a year and was extremely excited to be marrying her best friend, Jonathan. It also didn't make sense that she would just leave her phone, wallet and purse behind. The following day, Special Agent James Lawton of the FBI had an epiphany. Annie was a petite young woman, only 4 foot 11 and slender, and Agent Lawton's daughter just so happened to be the exact same size and weight as Annie. He asked her to lie flat on the floor, and after easily lifting her onto his shoulders, realised just how simple it would have been to pick Annie up and quickly hide her somewhere obscure inside Amistad. On September 12th, a second search of the Amistad building turned up a drop of blood on a shelving unit inside room G13. In the neighbouring storage room, G22, a bead from Annie's necklace was found on the floor. After lifting up one of the ceiling tiles in G13, agents discovered one of Annie's bloody socks and a solitary blue surgical glove. Luminol revealed a substantial amount of hidden blood in G22, and spray patterns in G13. The following day, investigators noticed a foul odour emanating from somewhere in the basement. It was a scent they were all familiar with. Cadaver dogs were brought to the scene at 5pm. They led detectives to the restroom between G13 and 22, and then to a specific bathroom stall. Sunday, September 13th, was supposed to be the day Annie shared her vows with Jonathan. It was supposed to be the happiest day of her life. Instead, it was the day her body was discovered inside the Amistad building, hidden upside down in a wall cavity behind a toilet. She had a broken jaw and collarbone, but had ultimately been strangled to death. There were signs that she had been essayed, and male fluid was found on her clothes. She was just 24 years old. Annie was laid to rest shortly thereafter. Her fiancé, Jonathan, was of course in attendance, wearing the wedding ring his eternal bride-to-be would have given him, had her life not been so cruelly snuffed out. In my last video, we covered the case of Sophie Sergi, a young woman murdered at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, an institution that was infamous for its poor security measures. In contrast, Yale had stringent security measures in place. ID cards were required to gain access to not only the Amistad building itself, 
but also each of the individual labs inside. That meant Annie's killer was almost certainly a fellow student or Yale employee, and one person in particular was on the FBI's radar. Raymond Clark III. They had been keeping tabs on Ray ever since they had first spoken with him. Not only had he claimed to have seen Annie leave the building, which was now demonstrably a lie, but they also noticed that he had scratches on his face and left arm. Initially, those were perhaps explainable, but new evidence now pointed to Raymond being the killer. Keycard records confirmed that only three people had swiped into room G13 on September 8th. One was Annie, one was a third party contractor who had already been cleared, and one was Raymond. He was also the only person to have swiped into G22 that day. In fact, he'd swiped in and out of rooms G13 and G22 55 times in total on the day Annie disappeared, far more than his usual activity. Cameras in the surrounding area had also captured Raymond acting suspiciously, especially after leaving the building during the fire alarm, when he sat on the street with his head in his hands. A witness later reported seeing Raymond scrubbing a drain in G13 with a cleaning solution, even though it didn't appear to need cleaning at all. All that evidence was compelling, but Raymond had a clean personnel record, and his supervisors described him as a diligent, personable worker. There was nothing to suggest that he would or even could commit such a heinous act. Perhaps there was an explanation for his bizarre behaviour that fateful day. Yeah, right. On September 15th, the investigators brought Ray in for questioning, and began by asking about his scratches. He claimed that he had simply been attacked by a cat. Interesting, because the marks actually lined up with fingernail scratches. But forget about that. Perhaps he could explain why on the 8th, he had signed his timesheets using a green ink pen, and signed out at 3.45pm with a black one. He claimed he had simply misplaced his green pen earlier that day. Interesting because a green pen just so happened to be found in that wall cavity, underneath Annie. Raymond called that a coincidence. They called it suspicious, and had Ray take a polygraph test. The results indicated that Raymond was being deceitful. Still, lie detector results are notoriously unreliable, and certainly not admissible in court as evidence. And as such, Raymond was allowed to walk free that day, but not before agents produced a warrant and took a sample of his DNA. It matched perfectly with the fluid found on Annie's remains, as well as with DNA found on the green pen, the items found in the ceiling, an extra large lab coat covered in red stains found in a lab recycling bin, and a pair of Viking brand boots found in a locker. Boots splattered with Annie's vital fluid. Boots labelled Ray C. Five days after Annie's remains were discovered, on September 17th, Law enforcement arrested Raymond Clark at a Super 8 motel in Cromwell and held him on a $3 million bond. In the face of over 250 pieces of evidence collected from both the Amistad building and his apartment, Raymond later pleaded guilty to taking Annie's life in exchange for a plea deal. He apparently expressed remorse for his actions, but refused to explain why he took her life. Without a motive to report on, News stations began coming up with some, frankly, disrespectful theories. Several outlets questioned whether Annie and Ray were having a secret affair, and if he had wanted to keep her from marrying Jonathan. If this was an if I can't have you, no one can type deal. However, there was absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. Raymond had only worked with Annie for four months before taking her life. The pair never socialised or saw each other outside of work. They had no text history and though Raymond had sent Annie an email reprimanding her for not keeping the mice cages clean, she had only responded professionally. No doubt, such media speculation only made Jonathan's grieving process more difficult. Although Raymond was most likely motivated by jealousy, it hadn't manifested in the same way that the media had reported. As would later come to light, Raymond wasn't a personable, well-adjusted, well-respected worker as claimed by his supervisors supervisors who just so happened to be his sister and brother-in-law. Impartial members of staff had described him as controlling and volatile, the type of guy who would fly off the handle if things didn't go his way. One of Raymond's former girlfriends attested to that. 
back in 2003, he had become so aggressive with her that she had to call the police. According to psychologists, Ray's anger may have stemmed from a sense of inferiority. As one Yale researcher put it, Raymond's mouse room position was very low level, low skilled, and low paying. He had no authority to be challenging anyone on their procedures, knew nothing of science, veterinary medicine, animal protocols or the like. Having never been a Yale student himself, and working as a technician alongside some of the world's best and brightest, Raymond may have perceived himself as low status. In contrast, he saw Annie as commanding a lot of respect from her peers, not just because of her magnificent mind, but also because she was friendly and well liked. Privately, Raymond likely harboured strong feelings about Annie, both feelings of resentment and idolisation. Ray also had a fiancé at the time, though perhaps his eyes had wandered. Perhaps he had developed a one-side fixation on Annie. On the day Annie was slain, the school had sent out a mass email to medical faculty members. Hello staff, this is a reminder that Annie will be taking a couple of days off in preparation for her wedding on September 13th. Authorities now speculate that this email may have sent Raymond into a white-hot rage. Keycard evidence proved that he had entered G13 at 11.04am, at which time the only other person inside the room was Annie. He wouldn't swipe out until 11.50. It's generally believed that in that 46 minute window, Raymond tried to force himself upon Annie, and she resisted. Enraged by her rejection, he took Annie's life inside the room and attempted to hide her inside the ceiling cavity. Realising that that wouldn't work, he swiped out and dragged Annie into G22, at which point the fire alarm was set off, some reports say by a faulty smoke detector, though some say it was triggered manually by Raymond to buy himself some thinking time. Given the timing, I think the latter is more likely. Raymond left Annie in G22. When staff were given the all clear, he then returned and transported Annie to the restroom, where he stuffed her inside the crawl space, accidentally dropping his green pen in the process. Throughout the day, Ray was caught several times on the basement camera wearing different scrubs, and in one shot, even wearing the same lab coat that was later found covered in red stains. The following day, he reportedly returned to the lab with a backpack containing wire, fishing hooks, and bubble gum, apparently hoping to fish the green pen out of the crawl space. Not that it would have mattered. He had made so many other mistakes that his arrest was a foregone conclusion. On March 17th, 2011, Raymond was sentenced to 44 years behind bars, without the possibility of parole. He's scheduled for release on September 16th, 2053. He'll be 70 years old. After the sentencing, his father, Raymond Clark II, read a statement to the press. My family and I extend our deepest sympathy to the Lay family. I want you to know that Ray has expressed extreme remorse from the beginning. I can't tell you how many times he sobbed uncontrollably, telling me how sorry he is. Our hearts are broken. It doesn't make any sense to us. This is not the Ray we know. Personally, I can't help but think that Raymond's tears weren't for the loss of Annie, but rather for the loss of his freedom. Annie was a wonderful young woman with infinite potential and a very happy future ahead of her. But that future was taken away from her by one selfish person, for seemingly the most selfish and senseless of reasons. A man who deprived the world of a brilliant mind, a kind heart, and a beautiful smile. A man who deprived Annie's family, and fiancé, of a beautiful soul. A huge thank you to my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon. George Lopez, Holly Lyons, Modest Bulbasaur, Smile and Jack, Alana Pons, Asia Mina, Asriel Warakai, Cass, Chief Gochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Sai Wazau, Farewell Tattoos Jack Seffel, Gina Valera, Hamish, Ian Billock, Monica Mendoza, Peter Lodgerich, TNS Mum, Hamish K, Ellen Doloff, Itai Allon, Nefus 1988, and Lydia Kumo. Thank you guys so much for your continued support.
Until next time. The Devils in the Detail.